Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Daily Way Refuel, where I cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan, and this is Sun, and today's the 19th of October, 2024. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So this episode's coming out on a Saturday, not the usual day that I do refuels on, but the reason why I'm doing one today is because I basically missed, you know, Wednesday and Friday of last week, and that was because of jet lag. Like, it hit me really hard. I was just super tired, not able to do a refuel because the energy just wasn't there, and I didn't want to do one where I was just kind of slurring my words, right? You might have heard some of it when I did the refuel on uh, on Monday. Um, I definitely was feeling it then, but then it just continued during the week, unfortunately. But I'm feeling a lot better today, so I figured I'd do one. And I think today's episode is going to be pretty interesting because it's not so much about talking about, I guess, like project updates as much as it is talking a lot about what I spoke about on Monday in terms of narratives, in terms of Ethereum's kind of position in the ecosystem, its North Star, and a lot of the discussions that have happened around that on Twitter, especially over the last couple of weeks. You guys may have noticed that I've become a lot more active on Twitter, trying to correct a lot of the misinformation and FUD that is out there. I typically been quiet on that for like the last maybe 12 to 18 months because I just couldn't be bothered with it. But I think that was a mistake, to be honest. I think that uh, it's very important to be correcting these things, not just on the refuel, um, but on Twitter, because obviously the reach on Twitter is a lot more than it is on on my podcast here. And we've also got a couple of new channels in the Daily Great Discord channel, in case you haven't noticed yet. We've got the FUD fighting channel where you can pay, basically post FUD and I'll, I'll uh, help to correct it on Twitter and in Discord. Uh, and then there's the ETH bull posting channel as well, where you can just post bullish ETH tweets and you know we can kind of support those tweets, retweet them and all that good stuff uh, there. But on that note, let's jump into, I guess the first thing I wanted to talk about today, which is basically Ethereum's mission. Now, obviously Ethereum has a pretty big mission overall. It wants to be, this absolutely massive kind of world-changing decentralized coordination engine. And that's just one way to describe it. There are so many different ways to describe what Ethereum is trying to be. But as I said, there's been this discussion around what an Ethereum's North Star should be. You know, what should be the thing that it's actually aiming for? And I don't think there's really one kind of thing that you can say, um, but I do think there is a, a bunch of things. And I try to distill this down into a message myself. And I put out this tweet, right? The, the mission or the North Star, I think, of the Ethereum ecosystem for the foreseeable future and probably forever is to scale Ethereum while keeping Ethereum decentralized, while making sure that ETH becomes the most valuable asset in existence. I think those are pretty good kind of points to hit on because it basically hits on most things that we're doing within the Ethereum ecosystem. Scaling Ethereum is obviously critical. We're doing that at both layer one and through the layer twos. And that is working magically right now. I think layer one scale um, I guess people see that it, 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 it's lagging, uh, but it's, it's I guess, like lagging because of the fact that it just takes longer because we can't scale Ethereum L1 uh, quickly. Uh, otherwise, we compromise on point two, which is keeping Ethereum decentralized. That's the whole point, right? Um, and then, of course, the, the third point, which basically goes into everything is making ETH the most valuable asset in existence, making sure that ETH accrues value from everything that's happening on the Ethereum network. And we do that via various different means, but I think that the, the most critical thing is making sure that ETH remains the de facto money within the Ethereum ecosystem and is a store of value as well. And in my opinion, we do that by increasing the available, um, uh, the availability of ETH, basically increasing ETH's uh, monetary value within the ecosystem by scaling ETH. So it all kind of falls into each other. By scaling Ethereum, we scale ETH. We scale the ETH network effects by scaling the Ethereum network effects. So that, that kind of all falls into each other there. And that's why I put out this tweet because I figured that it was just a really good, simple kind of, uh, uh, you know, three points that hit on everything that we want to see within the Ethereum ecosystem. But as I said, the North Star kind of discussion gets muddy because Ethereum is a decentralized ecosystem. It is really hard to get everyone to agree on one thing. And what is kind of funny to me is that for years now, I mean, I've been pushing the ETH is money, store of value kind of um, thing since at least 2019. So it's been five years now. But, but during that period of time, there's been plenty of holdouts. People saying, you know, ETH isn't money, ETH isn't a store of value it's gas for the network, it's a utility token, so on and so forth, which I understand, you know, if you come at it from like a te strictly technical perspective, that's what it looks like. But in terms of uh, the perspective of what it needs to be for Ethereum to succeed, I strongly believe that ETH needs to continue to accrue value and needs to be a store of value within that ecosystem and a money. And I think that the term money is actually misconstrued a lot. I think people don't understand that money doesn't mean the same as it means for fiat, for example. Like I'm not saying that ETH should be like the US dollar. I'm saying that ETH should have a monetary premium. It should be used as a way to uh, conduct commerce 
in various different ways on chain and even off chain. Maybe ETH never is good money, aka, it, aka it's not like as stable as we would want it to be relative to everything else, but I don't think that's actually an issue. And I've talked about this before in the past about stability and how I think about it, how uh, I think about purchasing power, things like that. For me, as long as my purchasing power is going up over time while I'm holding ETH, aka ETH is appreciating in value against pretty much everything else, then I'm happy with what, what, what ETH, ETH is doing here. But as I said, there are holdouts here, which I don't really understand because I don't really think that there's any negative for you as a person to, you don't have to support ETH being money or as a, or a store of value if you're in the Ethereum ecosystem and you're not trying to FUD ETH or anything like that. Um, but saying that it's not is actively harmful, right? So, so if you don't think it is, you can just like be neutral about it. Say, okay, well, I'm indifferent to ETH being a store of value, um, but like if it is, it is sort of thing. Instead of saying, no, it's not. Like, I don't understand the, the, the mentality behind these people. It's like, okay, well, but you saying, no, it's not, that just leads to less Ethereum adoption, uh, in, in my opinion, because we all know that adoption tends to follow an appreciating price. Like there's a wealth of, of the native asset. There is a massive wealth effect with these things. You saw this play out with ETH in 2017 with the ICO mania. You saw it play out with DeFi summer. There is a huge wealth effect that happens that, that gets um, directly kind of ported to the, um, to the chain itself and is able to um, further increase the usage of the chain and increase funding to develop the chain. And it's kind of funny because like the Ethereum Foundation has a lot of ETH and the more ETH goes up, the more money they have to fund Ethereum development and the more money um, they have to uh, to give out as grants to essentially fund things outside of Ethereum Core, you know, other things that we would like to see on the network. So again, I just don't see any negatives to ETH being worth more and more. Some people will say, well, if we're talking strictly technical, it is a negative because of gas prices. You know, the higher the price of ETH is, if the gas price remains the same, then in US dollar value, the gas price goes up. And while that is technically and strictly true, it doesn't follow a, a, a correlation like that. The ETH price going up does not mean that the gas price is going to go up. It, it, market activity generally does tend to map to gas prices, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And also the network, the Ethereum network does not see USD prices. It just sees ETH. It only knows ETH because the only way it could see USD prices is via an Oracle, but there is no Oracle that feeds into the Ethereum protocol. There are Oracles that sit on top, like Chainlink, for example, that is a smart contract on top of Ethereum, but it's not part of the actual core protocol. And you would never want to have an Oracle be enshrined as part of the core protocol for the USD price of ETH, because if that oracle was to ever be compromised, it could lead to really bad things happening on the network because it is enshrined at, at the core. That's why we prefer it to sit basically above at the smart contract level rather than the protocol level here. But as I said, if the Ethereum network only sees ETH, it doesn't see the USD price. And obviously the gas prices react to market activity uh, very heavily because DeFi is the main use case of um of crypto, of on chain, of the on chain uh, kind of ecosystem, and it remains to to be seen if that ever changes. I don't think it will. I think it, DeFi will always be the biggest use case, and it will always be the one that commands the most amount of money because of, I mean, not just because of MEV, but just because of the fact that when it comes to finance, you're willing to pay ten dollars to make a dollar profit, right? When it comes to, I guess, like social stuff, like decentralized social media, there's no strict, direct kind of like monetary relationship there. Like no one's going to pay a dollar to tweet, for example, because you're you're not getting anything out of that. Whereas you, if you're paying for like an arbitrage in, in gas fees, you're definitely going to pay $1 in gas fee to make a profit. Even if that profit's tiny, it's still profit at the end of the day. Whereas it's different for things outside of DeFi, of course. So that was the first tweet there. The second tweet was that, uh, as I said, there's been this discussion about like what Ethereum's kind of North Star should be. And as I said, it's different depending on who you kind of, I guess, ask but also people have maybe the wrong idea about what a north star is because vitalik put out this blog post recently um i think it was a couple of days ago where he basically detailed part two of the ethereum roadmap which is the surge and i shouldn't say part two of the ethereum roadmap because the ethereum roadmap is not something that happens uh, sequentially it happens in parallel uh but essentially he's talking about what the surge is and what its key goals are. And the key goals as listed here is that we have over 100,000 TPS on both L1 and L2. We preserve decentralization and the robustness of L1. At least some L2s fully inherit Ethereum's core properties, such as being trustless, open, censorship resistant, and maximum interoperability between the L2s. Ethereum should feel like one ecosystem, not 34 different blockchains. Now, some people will call this a North Star. I quote tweeted this and said a wild North Star appears, but I was kind of making fun of the term uh, because I don't believe this is a North Star. These are key goals, right? Like it's not 
it's not like, um, you know, it, it's more detailed than, than what I was talking about before when I said uh, in, in this tweet, scale Ethereum, keep it decentralized and make ETH the most valuable asset. Those are closer to what a North Star is than this because this is just a key goal. Like the first thing that he mentions here, 100,000 TPS on L1 and L2, that's the same thing as me saying scaling Ethereum, but he's actually putting numbers to this and that's getting too detailed to be a North Star, at least in my opinion. Uh, prever preserve decentralization and robustness of L1. That is the same thing as me saying keep Ethereum decentralized centralized, right? Uh, and then the other two points I didn't really hit on about making L2s fully inherit Ethereum's core properties uh, and maximum, inter maximum interoperability between L2s. Those are very important. Um, and I think that maybe you could say that the, the um, interoperability between the L2s, you know, Ethereum should feel like one ecosystem is a North Star, but these are definitely closer to these kind of key goals or key properties here than a North uh, Star there. But you should go give that blog post a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description uh, for you to do so. The next tweet I want to talk about was something that I put out around blobs. Now, everyone knows that blobs are what we use to scale Ethereum L2s. They're where the L2s post their data instead of call data. And blobs have been free for pretty much their entire life. And this has caused a lot of discussion within the community around the fact that should blobs be free? Like, should we be charging more for them? Right now, they're just free. The L2s are just free riding on the network while they make a lot of money from their sequences, so on and so forth. And as you can see from this chart here, I, I posted this tweet where I said, you know, the blobs are almost at the target of three, ETH, uh, three blobs per block. Going to be interesting to see what happens when blobs enter a period of sustained price discovery. Now, I didn't elaborate on what I meant by this, and some people took this to mean that I thought that blobs going into price discovery was good because we're going to burn more ETH and it's going to be amazing, but that's not what I meant by this. There was two main things that I meant by this. The first thing is that I want to see how the ecosystem reacts in terms of are the L2s going to stop using blobs as their as their data availability layer and go somewhere else because of sustained um, blob price discovery. That's, that's, that's the first thing there. And then the second thing, was the fact that how long uh, would they be doing this for? Like how long would they put up with this? How long would their users put up with this? Because as um, uh, things get more expensive for blob on blobs, they do tend to get more expensive on the L2s as well. It is not a linear relationship. It tends to essentially um, uh, not be like one-to-one -one mapping or anything like that. And the fees on L2s aren't gonna go like ridiculously high like they do on on, on mainnet uh, uh, overnight or anything like that. But there is that kind of period there. And also um, would this be in, in impotence for the core dev to understand that we need to add more blobs because there's been the whole discussion around should we add more blobs now or should we wait? Obviously, you guys know I've been strongly in favor of scaling blobs as much as we possibly can. I believe blobs are a loss leader for the network. I do not believe that we need to be charging the um, charging too much for blobs at this point in time. Maybe we can fix the blob fee market to be more reactive to uh, spikes in demand and to be more efficient, but I do not believe, and maybe have a minimum fee there as well, but I do not believe that we should be um, trying to uh, essentially charge extra rent from L2s just because uh, they're currently free loading or free riding or free loading right now, which I think is the wrong way to, to to, to, to think about it, because as I said, blobs are a loss leader to scale Ethereum. In my in, in my opinion, it's totally fine that they are not uh, paying too much right now, because what we're getting in return is is two main things. One, we're scaling ETH the asset, right? We're getting ETH into more people's hands because they're using it on these L2s. And two, which is in, even more important, is that we are preventing users from bleeding to other L1 ecosystems, uh, in, the existing users, and we're onboarding new users into Ethereum, because without l without cheap L2s and without blobs really to enable that, these other users would be, or these new users, I should say, would be going to these other L1s. And that is the worst possible outcome for Ethereum ever. Like that is the, if, if we're talking about like North Stars, that is like legit opposite of a North Star for Ethereum. We should not want that to happen ever. And that has happened previously because we didn't have cheap L2s and we had L1 be super expensive and it's getting more expensive again as the market heats up, of course. So, as I said, I believe blobs are a really great loss leader. We should fix the fee market so that we can have a more reliable fee market for blobs and it's more reactive to things, but we should not and, I, and I'm, I'm strongly in, fa in favor of, of, of never doing this, uh, never, uh, maybe not never, but like not anytime soon, um, charging extra rent just because we feel like they're free freeloading or free riding. They're not, they are giving something back to the network. It's just not directly measurable as fee revenue. And as I've said before, I do not even believe that fee revenue for ETH and the burn and all that good stuff there it is the main value driver of ETH. If it was, ETH would not be worth over $300 billion. I'll tell you that now, ETH would be worth very, very, um, 
uh, very, very much less than that, like maybe $10 billion or something like that. It would definitely not be worth 300 plus billion. And the reason why it is worth that and the reason why I think it will continue to be more valuable over time is because it is a money and it is a store of value. And as I've said before, the store of value uh, thing is mostly a story, right? It's a narrative. It's a shared collective belief. It is not something that can be objectively measured. It is not something that you can use metrics to really measure. It is more like a vibe than anything else. It is a story. It is very similar and akin to a organized religion or a cult, really. I know it may seem a bit funny to say that, but that's what it's like, a shared belief, a shared delusion, if you will. That's exactly why BTC is worth what it's worth. The Bitcoin network does it nothing. I mean, the, the, the ordinal stuff is so broken. The UX is so horrendous. And anyone pointing to that as utility for Bitcoin, I don't think that that is, is right at all. And also Bitcoin was already worth near $1 trillion before ordinals even became a thing. Right. So if you look at it from that, perspective, actually, it was worth back in the last cycle over a trillion dollars before ordinals became a thing. So from that perspective, we already have all the evidence that we need that to be sustainably worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, if not tens of trillions of dollars, the asset needs to be a money. It needs to be a store of value. There is no other path to that market cap, to that level of market cap for crypto assets. I strongly believe that. And that's why I keep pushing that ETH is money, ETH is a store of value. And that's why I believe everyone should keep pushing that because it has so many positive effects for the Ethereum ecosystem uh, in so many different ways. Like, like there's too many to name essentially, right? Um, I mean, I can name a few, but narrative is a big thing, making it so that the ecosystem feels like, okay, yeah, ETH is a store of value. It's a money, you know, holding ETH is great. Being involved with Ethereum is great, right? Bringing more attention to Ethereum, bringing more builders to Ethereum, bringing more users to Ethereum. There is literally no negatives in my mind of ETH price going up. And yeah, okay, people make money if it goes up. Like if that annoys you, then so be it. But people are going to make money anyway, no matter where it is. We'd rather than make money in the Ethereum ecosystem so that they stay within the Ethereum ecosystem and we are able to build better products and we're able to get more stuff done on Ethereum here. At least that's my view there. Now, another tweet here that I believe is kind of uh, related to this, yes, this comes from Francis. This is an all, um, all core devs uh, update regarding blobs. So EIP seventy seven forty two will be included in um, in Pectro, it seems like, and this unlocks blob targets uh, slash the max increase effort, aka adding more blobs to the network. So it does seem like we're going to get a blob limit increase in the Pectro hard fork, which I believe is still due for like March next year. Um, there may be a period of time between now and then where we see sustained blob. Um, and blob price discovery, um, it, you know, above the target there. But scaling is coming. Additional scaling is coming. At least it seems like that. It's not like, I think, 100% officially, you know, confirmed yet, but it seems like we're, we're headed towards that. In terms of like what we're going to increase it to, I don't know. There was discussion of increasing it to five, uh, sorry, four being the um, target from three uh, and then eight being the max. But now there is discussion around five being the target and nine being the max. So I would prefer the latter, to be honest. I'd prefer as many blobs as we can get. But at the same time, we also don't want to be adding adding blobs if it means that we're increasing bandwidth requirements for solo stake as I discussed this on I believe Monday's episode this is a very important thing um, and bandwidth requirements of the overall uh, overall network here so there is a lot of work uh, around this happening um, as we have these discussions but I figured that was worth highlighting for you guys there and there was another tweet here from David who basically and details what he wants to see about uh, when it comes to blobs. Uh, first thing is, uh, I guess like first thing he discussed here is what happens when blobs enter price discovery. So he says here, data gas fees will start rising, increasing the price of blobs. As I mentioned, L2s already pass on the cost to their users. So L2 fees will increase, of course, by how much until the point where the average demand of blobs goes down to three. Some L2 users will not send transactions at the higher price. Likely low value transactions will go first, like low value NFT mints. Same thing happens on L1, right? Things get priced out. Uh, this will re-equilibrate re the fee distribution between L1 and L2 somewhat, but it will add significant friction to L2's growth trajectory. So he's basically highlighting the same issue I am. We don't want blob price discovery, right? So what do we do? We're so uh, David is in strong support of increasing the blob limit ASAP, which is great because so am I. Uh, then we should upgrade to a better pricing mechanism that charges higher than the minimum one-way data gas fees when the blob market is not congested and handles demand spikes and temporary congestion gracefully. Again, what I mentioned that I want to see. And we should continue increasing blob capacity with peer DAS and finally full DAS or data availability um, 
charting here. So essentially, uh, David and me are completely aligned on what we want to see here. And I believe that a lot of people within the uh, kind of Ethereum community are aligned around this. There is some people that want to see more research and study done on how increasing blobs uh, affects the network overall in, in terms of bandwidth usage, especially, which is great. That's happening as well. So, but as David ends his tweet with, we don't want to be in a situation where there's consistently more blob demand than supply. That is not what we want to see at all, because I do believe that L2s that are using um, Ethereum blobs right now will stick around for a while then it's not like they're going to leave straight away but if we don't have a credible commitment to keep scaling blobs they will choose another da layer and that in my opinion isn't like that bad it's not like it's a huge bear case because it's kind of funny when you actually spell it out you say okay well ethereum da is going to be so successful that l2s are going to uh change where they they, they store their da uh that's not a bear case to me what the bear case is though is the second order effect or essentially like it is the, it is still a first order effect but it's it's something that's more downstream of this where the fees on l2s will get higher that is the loss because then the users start bleeding out from them and we don't want that to happen we want to keep the users on l2s and the way we do that is by keeping l2 fees cheap that is the number one way we do that there are other ways of course but that is the number one way there so fully aligned there with david on uh, that as i think we all should be Next up here was another tweet by yours truly about how I think about decentralization um, as a concept generally. So I think I've talked about this before on the refill, but I think about decentralization as an emergent property rather than a property in of itself. And what I mean by this is that it tends to emerge based on a bunch of different properties and I've listed them out here. So the first one is having a secure and reliable chain, aka no downtime. That is one of Ethereum's core promises that it is secure, it's reliable, it's not gonna go down on you, uh, it's not gonna get DDoS, like other chains, it's going to be it's going to be great, right? Second point here is a credibly neutral network. There is no playing favorites. The Ethereum network does not play favorites. It does not give preferential treatment to base over arbitrum. It doesn't give preferential treatment to you as a user over another user there. It has uh, objective ways of controlling uh, things like the fee market, for example, but it is credibly neutral, right? That is, I mean, that's the only way we know how to control for DDoS attacks and control for spikes in demand is through a fee market. And it's an objective way of doing it, right? If you have the money to pay for it, then you, then you pay for it and that's it. Like we're not discriminating against it. Like if you have $10 to, to pay a fee and someone else on the other side of the world has $10 to pay a fee, you both get equal access to the network. Then I know that some people will say, well, we, it's kind of discriminating against, I guess, like people who don't have that money. It's like, yes, but that's not what we talk about when we talk about credibly credible neutrality. We talk about the fact that if you assume that things are on equal footing here, then um, in an objective fashion, in terms of like, I guess, fees in this case, then no one is playing favorites there. And then of course, obviously we want to kind of scale up that credible neutrality via L2s so that it isn't just for people that have money. Uh, and then censorship resistance, same thing. Uh, no one can prevent transaction inclusion forever. Currently, obviously, you are not guaranteed to get your Tornado Cash transaction included in every block because of the fact there is some censorship on the network, but no one has ever claimed that these networks, or they shouldn't be claiming that these networks are censorship proof because they are not. They're censorship resistant. They can have censorship on them at the inclusion level because we basically give the ability to uh, validators um, to include whatever the transactions they want to or not include what they want to, but you can still get your, get your Tornado Cash transaction in because the network is censorship resistant. There is no one preventing you from getting your transaction included forever, no single person. Obviously, if 100% of the network was censoring that, then you wouldn't be able to get it in, um, but it's that's not happening. For, and, 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 and on Ethereum, for that to happen, is basically, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's improbable because there's so many different block producers out there. We have so many solo stakers, right? We have so many people that will uh, include your transaction. Yes, it might take a while, but as I said, it won't prevent your transaction inclusion, inclusion forever. The next property is diversity of clients, which means no single point of failure. Ethereum kills every other ecosystem at this. Nothing is even close to this. And I, I think this in particular is one of the major reasons why I believe Ethereum is more decentralized than Bitcoin because Bitcoin has one client that accounts for like 99% of the network. If that client ever has a kind of like buggy net or ever has um, something critical that needs to be fixed, there is only a small group of people that can fix that and it would require everyone to upgrade in order to fix that. 
uh, because they're all running the same thing. When it, but when it comes to Ethereum, we have a diversity of clients. We have 10 plus clients, five on either side, execution layer, consensus layer. So there is no single point of failure here. And our client diversity is really, really good right now, as I've discussed before on the refuel. So that's an, a critical point here. One of the other most critical points is the ability to run a full node on consumer hardware so you can verify the network for yourself. This is one of the holy grails of, of, of crypto. One of the things that crypto really enables is that you are able to verify the rules of the entire network uh, for yourself. There's no need to trust anyone else to do this. And this falls directly into a the ability to be part of consensus on consumer hardware, aka be part of the proof of stake consensus mechanism on Ethereum, be a staker. And this leads to a wide distribution of miners and stakers, miners before, with Ethereum proof of work, stake is today with Ethereum uh, proof of stake there. And that is why we have so many um, full nodes, so many solar stakers, so many people that are there to defend the network and to decentralize the, net the network. Uh, uh, there's uh, the last couple of points here is a good distribution of the chain's native token. So there's no, uh, no plutocracy. There is no one holder that has so much ETH that they can exert influence over the network by holding that much ETH. Uh, and then the last point is reliable distributed funding for core developers like with the protocol guild which leads to sustainable funding as far as i know there is no other chain that has something like the protocol guild at least not on that level they all rely directly on their uh, re relevant foundations to fund the core development of them which in my mind is not sustainable it is not a good way of doing things and it does not lend itself to decentralization obviously and i finished off this tweet by saying this is why decentralization can be hard to measure and define you have to measure and define all of those things that i just mentioned and then place your relative importance on them of course the ethereum ticks all of the above boxes and more but we must continue to improve ethereum so that we can scale this decentralization to the world and not just to people who can afford L1 transaction fees. And I mentioned this before. There is no use having all of these properties if it is for a small group of people who can afford the fees. And that's why the roll-up centric roadmap is so cool is because we do have a way to do this. We do have a way to scale this up. You don't scale decentralization up by throwing hardware at it and making it harder to, ver to verify the network, making it prohibitively expensive to be part of consensus, not having client diversity, like sacrificing all that just to achieve some kind of short-term scale is not worth it at all. It, it, it really... It, it completely defeats the purpose of what we're building here and it doesn't scale <laughs> it doesn't even scale so so like uh, this is what this is what puzzles me it doesn't even scale to begin with i mean okay i should say it scales to begin with but then once you hit a certain point it doesn't it doesn't scale to the world it doesn't scale to billions of users it doesn't scale to billions of humans and trillions of machines and it never will and and this is not based on just crypto kind of architecture it's based on computing architecture that we've known for decades now so anyone saying that they can scale everything on on one layer and do everything on one layer is 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 either just outright lying or just doesn't understand. And, and you know, if you don't understand, fair, sure, uh, that, that's fair enough. We'll educate you. But if you're saying it and uh, you still understand how this all works, then you're just blatantly lying, I think. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll digress on that point then. Now, the next thing was another tweet that I put out. And sorry, there's a lot of tweets that I put out, um, but I figured that I'd, I'd love to expand on all these tweets on the refill because you guys probably read my tweets and are like, okay, well, uh, I'd love for him to expand on it or detail this more. And this tweet was about uh, based rollups. So I put a tweet out where I said, I do believe that based rollups should be the ultimate end game for Ethereum, unless something better comes along later, of course. But right now we don't foresee anything in, anything better, but we could be surprised in the future. But to have good based rollups, we need to have a better layer one. Namely, we need to decrease slot times to at least two seconds and implement single slot finality so that we don't have to totally rely on economically secured pre-confs for good based rollups. Now, I'm going to unpack that there because I know that can be quite confusing for people who don't understand what this is. So what is a based rollup? In the, I guess like the simplest terms, a base rollup is a rollup that uses the Ethereum L1 validator network for its sequencing, for its um, transaction ordering and, and inclusion so that you can get uh, interoperability between base rollups because you're all using the same Ethereum layer one here and a better decentralization because you're not using a centralized sequencer here. But the main drawback right now of doing of a based rollup is that you have to wait a uh, entire Ethereum slot or or I guess like it's not technically a block but like it, it, it it's technically called a slot which is 12 seconds. So if you put a transaction through and a slot was just proposed, you have to wait up to a 12 seconds to get your transaction included. Horrible user experience, right? We all know using L1 Ethereum is that like we we'd love our transactions to go faster, but it literally can't because an Ethereum block is or slot I should say is 12 seconds. So in order to rectify this for based rollup 
ups, there are two ways you can do this. You can decrease slot times, so from 12 seconds to at least two seconds, because I believe anything um, uh, more than two seconds, people get antsy. It's like loading a website. If you have to wait more than two seconds, you're starting to be like, oh, well, it's not worth it. I'm just going to click off. So at least at least two seconds. Ideally, it would be one second, but you, you have to look at this in percentage terms, right? Going from 12 seconds to two seconds is already a massive jump. Going from two to one is also is, is a huge jump in percentage terms. It's like a 50% reduction again. And there are, there are all these different kind of externalities that fall off of this. So just getting to two seconds to begin with is, is quite difficult. It's not going to happen probably anytime soon, but uh, that is definitely something that is being worked towards. Uh, and on top of that, we want to implement single slot finality so that uh, essentially finality today takes like 12, 13 minutes, um, or whatever it exactly is on mainnet. But but uh, we want to be able to Im implement single slot finality so that the chance of a reorg basically goes to uh, not zero, but like essentially zero because it, within two seconds, you get finality on the network. That is really big deal, a huge deal. Again, something that's being worked on, not going to go live anytime soon, but hopefully eventually there. Now, as I said, there, there were two ways to do base rollups here. The second way is to do what's called pre-confirmations. Now, what pre-confirmations are is essentially they'll give you a kind of soft confirmation of your base rollup transaction within, I mean, as fast as you want, basically the speed of light. You can probably do it in like four, 500 milliseconds, right? But this is not a confirmation on the Ethereum L1 because as I said, the Ethereum L1 takes up to 12 seconds to include your transaction in the uh, in the slot, right? In, on, on the network essentially, because it takes 12 seconds for a slot to, uh, to be proposed here for a slot to, to happen on Ethereum, so for a block to be proposed. So um, the way that the pre-comps work is that essentially, I mean, there are different ways to do this, but essentially uh, a group of people or people running this software put up a bond, like a collateral bond, and basically say, okay, I'm not going to do anything dodgy. I'm going to promise to include these transactions in an Ethereum slot once it gets proposed, uh, but I'll do, I'll give you guys a pre-comp really, really quickly. Uh, like uh, basically I promise that I'll include these transactions if you, you pay the fee, right? And they, they make a little fee here and that's all well and good. That's why I say this is an economically secured thing, not a cryptographically secured thing, because you're using money, you're using collateral as a way of quote unquote securing this. And, and it's, it's basically a promise that it'll get included on um, on the network. This is the way that the fast bridges work between different L2s and different L1s, or at least some of them work today. Uh, because when we talk about different ways of securing things is either the crypto economic way or the cryptographic way, we want to do as much as we can using the cryptographic way, but it's not always possible, especially when it comes to things like oracles. It needs to be crypto economic because the network, it cannot objectively see what happens outside of it. So we have to rely on um, on economically secured stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Nothing wrong with that at all. I said that here basically that it acts as a really nice solution until we get um, until we get a, a slot times of two seconds, but pre-comps are still gonna be a thing even if we do get that because of the fact that even two seconds might be too slow for a lot of, um, a lot of things that people want to do, especially for bots. So they'll still use pre-comps as long as they're happy taking on the risk that it's not cryptographically secured, it's crypto economically secured. So they go hand in hand, but based rollups are, uh, uh, in my opinion, the ultimate end game. We should definitely work towards them and it solves a lot of the issues that we have with L2s today. Uh, the, I guess like namely the two chief issues, are centralization of sequences uh, and a lack of interoperability. Now, of course, based rollups are not the holy grail. They're not going to be suited to every single use case and they're not going to be suited to every single L2 but they are a really good solution. And on top of this, I believe that um, base rollups do require the... Um the rollups to share the same DA layer. So it actually keeps um, Ethereum blobs sticky. I have to check on this. I'm not 100% certain about this, but from what I've seen, it does require um, the, the DA layer to be the same, but I might be wrong here. Um, but it, it definitely does require the the, 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 the proofs, the, the ZK proofs to be posted on the on, on, on the Ethereum L1, of course. But when it comes to data, I'm like 50-50 on it. I think that it would require that, especially depending on the construction, right? Because like different DA layers have different block times and, and different things. Like it gets a bit muddy here, but but, uh, but yeah, base rollups, in my opinion, are the, I, I don't know if I'd say like, I mean, I said here ultimate end game for Ethereum, but I, uh, sorry, I said that they're the ultimate end game. I don't know if they're like the holy grail. They're really, really great. They're what we should be working towards, but they're not going to be a silver bullet. They're not going to fix, well, they're not going to be like suitable for every single use case out there. And that's totally fine. But I believe that they will be suitable for most things, especially the things that um, I guess like have the, um, the most value attached to them there. Now, last tweet from me uh, before I move on to a couple of other things. So I basically put out this tweet, which I think is, is critically important here. And I, I want to read out the whole thing where I said, Ethereum is trying to sit in the Goldilocks zone of being maximally decentralized at layer one while being expressive enough to allow for things like scaling at layer two. 
To be sure, this is a very difficult task and why Ethereum tends to find itself in a place where most people struggle to understand it and why they should value care about it. Regardless of that though, I think that the Ethereum is definitely succeeding at finding this Goldilocks zone so far. There are hundreds of people working on layer one and being sustainably compensated for it by the community, via the protocol guild. Uh, there are over 10 clients powering layer one, and this gives us true client diversity. There are over 10,000 full nodes across the globe. We have the most solo slash home stakers of any chain by far. No other chain even comes close to this. And we have a flourishing ecosystem of layer twos where users get cheap fees and fast transactions and blobs are working perfectly to scale L2s. And I said, oh, and then I said, oh, and of course, Ethereum has not given up on scaling the base layer. It just wants to do it while preserving decentralization, aka not brute forcing it by throwing hardware at it. I understand that people want Ethereum layer one to move faster, but that directly goes against many of the core beliefs and values of Ethereum. In saying that, we can still put more emphasis on potential scaling parts on layer one and work more diligently to del deliver them, especially those that enhance layer twos. Let's scale all of Ethereum while keeping it great. Um, so this concept of, of like a Goldilocks zone is extremely hard to achieve just by nature because what you're trying to do is essentially thread a needle. And as I mentioned, the needle we're trying to thread here is keeping Ethereum L1 maximally decentralized while scaling that at layer two. And the reason why this is so difficult to do is not necessarily on the technical front because technical stuff gets solved over, over time by smart people. It's more on, I guess, like the narrative front. It's more on convincing people to look further than like a month in this industry because this stuff is taking many years to play out. And I would actually argue that by, the, by um, the time this is all said and done, or at least gotten to a point where we're, where we're like 90% done with this, it will have been a good decade, starting in 2020, ending in 2030, of building towards this future. So that kind of timeline for people in crypto is not gonna gel with them very well. And that's why, or at least one of the reasons why, you see so much FUD about Ethereum is because people just simply do not understand what Ethereum is trying to do. No other network is trying to be in this zone, this Goldilocks zone. They're either scaling their L1 by throwing hardware at it, which means they're giving up on decentralization, or they're being so decentralized that they can't do anything else, such as Bitcoin, for example. Or I guess like probably saying that they're so decentralized is, is incorrect here. I think that they're being so dogmatic about not doing anything at layer one that they essentially, um, I guess, like handicap themselves into doing nothing. And I guess like that works for Bitcoin um, because of the fact that BTC has managed to convince people that it is, uh, sorry, the Bitcoin community has managed to convince people that BTC is a store of value and it's got a lot of, uh, you know, it's got trillions of dollars in market cap and it seems like it's on its path to basically be that digital gold that they've always talked about. But outside of that, it does nothing else, right? Whereas Ethereum is trying to do all of it. And it wants ETH to be a store of value as well, right? So that even, that complicates things even further. But I think that is the number one reason why people are so confused by Ethereum. They do not understand it and they don't necessarily want to understand it because they don't want to have to realize that it's going to be like a decade play. And that's not to say that the ETH value can't go up and down a lot during that, that period of time, but I'm not really talking about ETH the asset. I'm more talking about Ethereum, the network and how it all works here. And, and I think that we're doing very well right now, as I mentioned in these, in these points that I made here. We're doing very well on both fronts. I think one thing or maybe two things that we could be doing better on, which I think is going to get better is uh, over time. One is storytelling and, and narrative weaving around this. And two is basically putting a little bit more emphasis on scaling the L1. I think that there are some short-term things that we can do. I know I've been against this in the past, but there are so sh some short-term things, th short things we can do as a pure sig signaling mechanism to convince people that we are dedicated to scaling the L1. And one of them is increasing the gas limit. I know I've been against this in the past, and I still kind of like am in terms of, I guess, if you're talking about what impact it has on the network itself, like I don't actually think it's, it, it'll be, it'll do much to scale the network, but in terms of being able to, uh, I guess, like tell a story about this and show the world that yes, we're committed to scaling L1 Ethereum. It's just going to take longer because of, uh, you know, such and such reasons as I've outlined here. So yeah, that was that tweet there. But yeah, I've gone I've gone a bit over time here today, but there are one, a couple of other things I just wanted to talk about quickly, not uh, tweets, just basically news from the ecosystem. So I don't know if, the, if I've covered this before, but there's a website called restaking.info that was built by uh, Nethermind here that allows you, or sorry, that is powered by Nethermind here that allows you to see a bunch of um, data around um, Eigen DA, or sorry, I should say Eigen Layer restaking right now. I think they might add other um, other restaking protocols to this eventually, but there's a bunch of information on here for you to check out if that is something that you want to do. I'll link that in the YouTube description below uh, for you to do so. And the second thing, uh, which is a major announcement actually, 
out of fuel. So fuel's main net is now live. They're calling this the fuel ignition, which is a supercharged Ethereum L2 verifiable at home. Now fuel has been working on this for quite a while. They did have V1 of their kind of network that they had put out a little while ago. Um, but yeah, this is, I guess, basically V2, or, or, or they're calling it ignition of their second um, a version of, of fuel. You can go check out the blog post for more information on this. Now, the reason why fuel I think is interesting is because it's not just like another EVM L2. They're using something called the fuel v VM and a UTXO based asset centric architecture um, while utilizing Ethereum's uh, Ethereum security, of course. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, UTXO is a transaction for format that is used by a Bitcoin and it's also used by Cardano, I believe. Um, but obviously, um, Bitcoin was the one that invented it and pioneered it here. It is unique and, and, and enables unique things. It is different to the account based model that Ethereum has here. Um, but as I said, like this is being used in conjunction with something called the fuel VM, which is not just uh, an, another EVM. And I think we've got enough EVM L2s at this point. I don't think we really need many more than that. So it's great to see that there is something different live here. Now, the key stats that they're pointing to is that they've been able to to do 600 plus TPS using Ethereum blobs on mainnet. Their fees have remained incredibly low, basically zero. I mean, it's not even worth me reading out this number because it's basically zero. Block times of one second uh, and obviously using blobs for DA security here. And they have a, a, an ecosystem map to sit to show you which um, apps they have live there right now. But you can go check out this blog post for more details about this and obviously bridge in if you want to. Now, of course, as per usual, this is a new project, new protocol, probably has centralized training wheels around it. So make sure you're aware of that before you uh, bridge in and before you put any serious kind of capital on this. But just great to see another non-EVM based L2 going live here. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll I'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.